Ahoy mates, Julie here, and welcome aboard Friday's episode of The Voters TV. First up, we navigate over to Nautical News, where, da 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 da, it's showtime! The 37th Annual Newport International Boat Show is expecting a packed roster of exhibitors and visitors when it opens on September 13th. This year's show, running through the 16th, will feature new sail and power boats and thousands of products and services from both domestic and international exhibitors. New dock space has been added this year to exhibit formula boats, with plenty of classic boats, luxury yachts, and new debuts covering the rest of the show's 15 acres. Over 850 exhibitors displaying more than 700 boats from 16 to 85 feet make the Newport International Boat Show one of the five largest in-water boat shows in the country. Anxious to get into a new boat? The Newport Show will also feature a test drive area by appointment, and over 100 previously owned boats will splash down at the Newport Brokerage Boat Show just across the harbor at the Newport Shipyard. The Newport Show is notable for organizing press, manufacturers, and resellers across the boating industry. For example, Newport for New Products, the show's new product program, which already lists 40 new entries, is the official venue for U.S. debuts of all new boats and boating products. To read about the new products whose entries have already been accepted to debut at the event, visit the show's official website at www.newportboatshow.com and click on the Newport for New Products icon in the middle of the homepage. Next up, for a different type of boat display, we think you should add the spot featured in our next segment to your list of 1,000 places to visit before you die. And we're going to tell you about it, eh, just for the whole of it. Underwater archaeology is apparently a frustrating field because most bodies of water are filled with the shipworm Terrado navalis, which usually destroys submerged wood very rapidly. In 1956, however, an amateur archaeologist named Anders Franzen reasoned that the Baltic Sea's cold, brackish water most likely made it uninhabitable for this most destructive shipworm. It was later discovered that heavy pollution before the 20th century also drove out all the salmon and other organisms that most likely threatened the structural integrity of sunken ships. Based on this assumption, he began his quest to raise the Vasa, the folly of Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus back in the 1600s. The great warship was plagued with construction problems since the design stage and rushed to launch in order to secure the Baltic during the Thirty Years' War. Minutes after setting sail in 1628, she foundered and sank 32 meters. While no one was found guilty for the negligence and the sinking was attributed to an act of God, rather than being top-heavy with insufficient ballast, the Vasa sinking was a major economic disaster for the already troubled Swedish state. Many of the ship's valuable guns were recovered soon after she sank, but Vasa herself seemed lost to the depths. The site was rediscovered in the mid-1800s, but it wasn't until Franzen's 20th century team came along and used 18 pontoon lifts and over 1,300 divers to raise her to dry docks. More than 26,000 artifacts and the remains of 16 people were also recovered. To prevent the 333-year-old ship from drying out and deteriorating, she was sprayed with polyethylene glycol for 17 years, followed by nine years of slow drying. After an architectural contest, the Vasa Museum was erected in Stockholm to house and preserve this great ship. Judging by the photos and first-person accounts by people who I've talked to that have been there, this place is incredible. It's definitely on my list of places to visit now. Temperature and humidity are carefully controlled in the museum to stem the creation of the sulfuric acid that currently threatens to destroy Vasa from the inside out. We'll cover more about the Vasa Museum in future episodes. The background was just too cool not to share. The museum was built to house a great ship, but the houseboats in today's power play are a little more human scale. The Travel Channel put out a list of top 10 luxury travel party spots, calling them the 10 hottest, sexiest, and craziest parties in the world. And a popular boating spot made the list. Coming in at number 10 is Arizona's Lake Havasu, where college kids, and simply the young at heart, have flocked for spring break for over 30 years. The Travel Channel article even suggests taking the party to a higher level with co-ed, naked, cliff jumping. Okay, can I watch from the sidelines? <laughs> but the biggest draw is the partygoers rent houseboats and tie them together into a flotilla, creating an enormous party hopping playground where bikinis and beer are in never-ending supply. But you know, this story really got me thinking about houseboats. 
The Travel Channel mentions how the younger generations are getting into them, but I was recently at a gathering of yacht owners, many of whom were of the baby boomer generation, and they were all talking about how they wanted to trade in their yachts for houseboats. Several of them said they prefer the more low-maintenance boats and like that they can keep them on freshwater lakes. A few other non-boat owners chimed in that they thought it sounded like a terrific alternative to doing the RV thing cross-country once they hit retirement. Do I detect a new trend here? The styles and degree of luxury run the gamut with houseboats, and the more I look into them, the more I'm hooked on the idea of renting a houseboat for my next vacation. Join us on Monday when we explore some of the options that are out there. And hey, whether you'll be spending it on a houseboat, sailboat, canoe, or a kayak, a safe and happy boating weekend to you all. Take care. This episode of The Boaters TV has been brought to you by the letter Z. That's Z for Zulu and signifying, I require a tug.